So this presentation will be picking up where chapter two left off, which I guess makes sense, uh, that we were looking at large blocks of text that you might encounter in you know, an essay or a book or a newspaper article or something like that. And uh, it is somewhere in there is a specific argument that the author is presenting and we're trying to tease out exactly what that argument is we're trying to figure out what are the specific premises that are being expressed and the specific conclusion that's being expressed and then uh, once we've done that then we can assess how well the premises support the conclusion you know are we dealing with a valid argument or a cogent argument or is an argument that's really weak or invalid or something um, so, uh, when we're dealing with regular language, of course, it, it, it's used to express an argument, um, and so it can, can certainly does convey meaning and it conveys reasoning, you know, what are the reasons in favor of a conclusion, um, but it's also very frequently extremely complex, maybe vague and ambiguous, uh, can be very flexible, it can mean more than one thing, you know, it's malleable, uh, it includes a lot of emotional content, it can be very forceful or sort of weak, you know, sort of unforceful. Uh, and so we need to do work, which we sort of laid the groundwork for exactly what our goals are in chapter two. Um, but then this chapter is going to go even further in uh, converting this very complex natural language ways of expressing ourselves and converting that into like a, a well-formed argument that can be assessed for the quality of that argument. <clears throat> um, because logic is, or it's intended to be, when it's done properly, very clear, like hopefully perfectly clear, unambiguous, uh, very rigid, and very standardized so that uh, once we've got a well-formed argument, there sh it should be very, uh, should be wide agreement as to the quality of that argument. Um, once we've got it in front of us and it's sort of purified form, uh, then it doesn't matter sort of how we feel about it or any of these other things. Um, it just this argument either is valid or it's not valid, and that's it. Um, and this is good for assessing arguments, um, but as we say here, it's it's very rigid. Uh, so uh, this something can sort of be lost when we're using our natural language, uh, being flexible, having all this other emotional content and ambiguity and sort of the richness of the feel and meaning of natural language uh, can be very important, right? That's sort of how we you know communicate with other humans um, and really get into the depth so sort of what's going on in our own minds and truly communicating with each other in a deep way. Um, and that's wonderful. Uh, <clears throat> and so when we're converting that natural language into sort of well-formed arguments, that's great for assessing sort of the quality of the arguments, um, but you know, it's, it's a little bit limited in its ability to sort of capture everything that we're trying to convey in natural language. And so, you know, that's, that's sort of a problem if we think that logic is perfect, you know, that we could use logic to express every single possible thing. Um, that's, that is a little bit of a problem. Um, but uh, it's not really a problem so much as the way we're dealing with it here, because our job here is to assess the quality of arguments. Um, but it's just worth keeping in mind that uh, when we do convert natural language into logic, it is very rigid. And so there might be some things that are sort of lost. <clears throat> okay. So uh, one of the things that we're going to do, certainly in this presentation here, which is going to be kind of short, it's just kind of the first part of chapter three, um, is making very clear distinctions between different meanings of some of the terms that we're using. Um, and, and really defining these terms. So uh, some of this you probably already know, but just to make it really clear so that we're all starting from the same spot. <clears throat> uh, so a symbol is just any visual marking or auditory under utterance that's meant to represent some other thing. Um, so, you know, every single letter, um, even punctuation marks and all of these things, um, these are all individual symbols. Every sound that I'm making as I'm speaking here, these are auditory symbols that I'm using that, um, to represent some kind of meaning. 
Uh, this becomes even more obvious when you're presented with a language with which you're unfamiliar, especially if it's a language that uses a different alphabet or different sort of markings than what you're used to in your set of symbols that you use in your language, because then all you see is the symbols, right? The symbols themselves, and you don't know what those symbols are meant to represent exactly. Or, you know, you hear a language you're unfamiliar with, you recognize that symbols are being thrown your way, but you don't know what those symbols represent. And so all you see is the symbols themselves. Um, and a word, of course, is just a symbol that's made of other symbols. You know, each individual letter is a symbol, and then a word is just a symbol that's made of other symbols. Uh, and, but what we're really trying to sort of aim at, what we're trying to get across using these symbols are what's coming next year. So concepts, for example. So this is the mental idea. This is sort of the, the thing that shows up in your mind when you're, when you're presented with a familiar symbol. Um, so, and this is sort of what you understand when somebody presents you a symbol that you're familiar with, um, this shows up <laughs> and you understand what that symbol is trying to represent. Uh, closely related to that is the meaning, you know, the semantics, we sometimes call this. And so this is what connects the symbols to the concepts. And a proposition is then a sentence uh, that's asserting something about the world. Uh, and that then we can assess as being either true or false. Okay, so moving on. Uh, a statement, so this is some of the things that we've already mentioned here, um, but again, uh, just to be very clear, and by the way, the, the way we've been using this term statement in the first uh, presentation, certainly through chapters one and two, I even explicitly said this, was that a statement is a, a declarative sentence that can be assessed as being either true or false. And that's a fine way of thinking about a statement, but from now on, we're going to modify that meaning a little bit um, and stick with this much more precise account of uh, a statement and how it's distinct from a proposition. So rather than just simply being a declarative sentence that uh, can be assessed as being either true or false, we're going to be talking about a statement as just a set of symbols, right? A set of words in a specific syntactical form that is a certain sequence um, you know, that's sort of a, a standardized and understood uh, sequence of these symbols that's going to help us to understand what the symbols represent. That's what we mean by the syntax of the symbols of the statement. Um, <clears throat> and uh, if it's a statement, then the syntactical form is the declarative sentence form of a statement. Um, whereas a proposition, on the other hand, is the meaning that's being expressed by that statement. And so this is, you know, what, is it, what does the statement represent? What is the sequence of symbols in this syntactical form? What does that represent to us? What does that sort of bring to mind when we hear or we read this set of symbols? <clears throat> okay. Uh, so just to sort of dive into this a little bit better, here's some examples. Um, we've got three different statements here. Right. Ignore kind of the, the underlying word spell checking stuff going on there um, because the, the, the second two, of course, are not English. The middle one here is German and then the one on the right is Spanish. So uh, these are different statements because they're different symbol strings. Right? They're different sets of symbols. And since a statement is just a set of words, a set of symbols, then what we have here are three different statements, but one proposition. Right? Each of these statements express the same proposition, grass is green. Um, you know, it's expressing this proposition about the color of a particular variety of plant. Um, so we have three different statements that all express a single proposition. This, they all express the same proposition. <clears throat> uh, and a few other things to say about this. Um, so as we saw with the different languages, um, different statements can mean the same proposition or you know, another way of saying that is to say that the different statements can have the same propositional meaning. Um, uh, also uh, important to note is that a single statement, you know, the statement might be the same, but it's meaning, you know, what proposition is being expressed by the statement could change, um, either change over time. Uh, or change from one culture to another. So different, two different cultures that are using the same symbols, right? They're using the same language, but 
uh, a specific statement might, it, the proposition, proposition that's being expressed might be quite different. So for example, down here I have, um, you know, if I were to say, I play football, it's like, okay, that's a single statement, right? It's a set of symbols with a sy specific syntactical structure. Um, and in the United States, that means that, you know, I'm putting on a helmet and I have that weird sort of oblong ball uh, and you're tackling each other and that sort of thing. That's what I'm talking about. That's what football is. Um, but in England, that means that I can't use my hands. We're using a rounded ball and we can only kick things around and we're trying to kick it into a goal and so on. Um, so it's soccer is the term we use, of course, in the United States. But uh, so I play football. It's the same statement in England and the United States but different propositions. So that if we we're going to assess the truth value uh, of, you know, if I say, I play football, is that true or false? That might be a different assessment if, if I'm in England or if I'm in the United States. And then also over time, within a given culture, a statement can change its propositional meaning. Uh, so, you know, this one here, Bob is gay, like that certainly has changed uh, over time. You go back 100 years, 200 years ago in the United States, if we said Bob is gay, then that means that maybe he's happy, roughly speaking, it meant, it meant happy. Uh, whereas nowadays, it has to do with his sexual orientation. Um, and so it's the same statement, it's the same uh, sequence of symbols, but uh, the proposition has changed. And so therefore, our assessment of whether this is true or false and how we go about assessing whether that proposition is true or false has changed significantly over the years. So um, it's important to note then that the proposition, so the meaning behind this, that doesn't change, right? So saying that a, a certain per person is attracted to members of their uh, same sex, like, uh, well, that's sort of the propositional content here. So that's sort of the, the meaning that's evoked inside your mind when I say that Bob is gay. But uh, uh, so that doesn't change. Regardless of what symbols I use, you know, what statement I use to express that proposition, the proposition itself stays the same, even when the statements might change. Okay. Uh, so another distinction we need to make uh, is uh, cogn cognitive meaning versus emotive force. And we addressed this a bit in the last chapter as well, where the emotional content of what's being expressed uh, in almost all cases is pretty much irrelevant uh, for assessing the quality of someone's argument. Um, you know, the emotive force, it's sort of how this uh, author feels about things or how the author wants us to feel about things. And uh, like I said, um, except under rare circumstances, uh, we usually just sort of strip that away so that we can zero in on the specific logical content. Like what are the specific statements that are the premises and the specific statement that's the conclusion and how well are those related? How well do those premises actually support that conclusion? Usually the emotive stuff doesn't play a role in that. <clears throat> So, uh, yeah, the cognitive meaning, uh, if it's not already completely clear, is uh, the, in the specific information. What is, what is this proposition telling us about the world? Um, and this is something that we can assess as actually being true or false. <clears throat> Whereas uh, the emotive force, the emotional content, uh, like I said, this is, it's either the, showing us the way the author feels about this, what emotions the author is feeling, or, uh, and or, you know, this is the inclusive or, so this could be included, uh, is that the author could be trying to elicit specific emotions in their audience. Uh, and that can be very useful. Uh, it can help to get the audience on the side of the author, make it more likely that the audience will come to accept what the author is trying to say, um, or what conclusion the author is trying to, to draw from all of this. Um, but, if we're trying to assess this quality of the argument itself, you know, is this argument valid or is this argument cogent, that can be distracting, um, having all this emotional content. And uh, we can't really assess whether that's true or false or not. Um, it, it's pretty much impossible. Uh, in some cases, it might, there might be some possibility of assessing whether sort of the emotional content itself is true or false. Um, certainly, you know, when we're talking about does this make the author angry, does it make the author sad or, or happy or whatever, there could be some true or, truth or false to, the, uh, you know, to that. Um, you know, it might truly make us angry. Uh, but, you know, 
should you be angry about this? It's like, well, you know, that's not usually part of sort of the, the specific logical support for a conclusion, sort of how we feel about it. Um, so oftentimes the emotive force and the cognitive meaning can be sort of intertwined. And so it's our job to sort of tease those apart from each other. Uh, and we might require some rephrasing of a premise. So suppose there was an argument concerning the uh, ethical justification of capital punishment. And one of the premises says this, uh, inmates of death row are human vermin. Like, okay, well, that's a very charged way of expressing an idea, um, expressing sort of a meaning here um, that gives us kind of an emotional reaction and probably betrays that the author here has sort of an emotional uh, reaction towards people on death row. And so what's the cognitive meaning of this? Um, it would be a little silly to pick this first one as the cognitive meaning. You know, the inmates on death row are human rodent hybrids. You know, well, vermin are rodents, at least certain kinds of rodents are called vermin. Um, but it's probably not the case that the author is telling us about some weird genetic experiments that are happening inside of a prison. Um, probably what the, the cognitive meaning there is something more like the second one, right? That inmates on death row have low moral quality or something like that. And then that's going to play a role in deciding whether, for example, uh, capital punishment is, is ethically justified or not. <clears throat> okay, uh, this I, I pretty much already said this, that you know, the cognitive contents, what the world is actually like, we can determine whether that's true or false. Um, whereas the emotive force is just how we feel about it or how the author feels about it. And that's more difficult, maybe even impossible to determine whether it's true or false. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> the other thing that's going, that happens a in chapter three, in fact, most of chapter three is concerned with definitions uh, because what we're going to do is take, you know, the whole job here uh, is to take this string of symbols, specific words, and then even longer strings of symbols, you know, actual statements that express a specific proposition. We need to know what those words mean, right? What, what is the cognitive meaning behind these symbols? And uh, if we're competent, speakers of the language. Usually we just get it and we can understand it, but sometimes there might be some disagreement as to exactly what the cognitive meaning of a string of symbols is supposed to be. And that's where definitions come in. They help to clarify, obviously, they help to clarify the meaning of words. That's the whole point. Um, and once we have a clear meaning, then we have an easier time of assessing the quality of an, of an overall argument when we know what the words in the argument actually mean um, and what the author intends for those words words to mean. And that's uh, especially helpful for uh, terms that are ambiguous or vague. And I've used those terms a decent amount so far. So uh, maybe we should define what those actually are. Um, so uh, an ambiguous word, uh, this is, these are different, right? And being ambiguous and being vague, these are sort of distinct notions. Um, so being ambiguous means that the word has more than one distinct reference or more than one distinct meaning. So for example, think of pitch. You know, so if I said, uh, pay attention to the pitch. Like, so what do I mean there exactly? Um, it could mean pay attention to the pers person that's, you know, the, the throwing of a baseball towards a batter um, in a baseball game. So that's a pitch. Um, or if I, it could be if we're in a choir, <laughs> I'm worried about sort of the, the note that you're hitting with your voice, pay attention to your pitch. Um, or uh, in England, when they're playing football, uh, they're out on the pitch, that just means the playing field. Uh, pitch can also mean sort of the angle, say like the angle of a roof. Uh, so there's all these different uh, meanings of the word pitch, but those are very distinct and relatively precise meanings. Um, for that term. It's just they're distinct from one another. So if I say pay attention to the pitch, well, you might say, well, hold on, um, could you please tell me what meaning of pitch you're using here and give me the definition that you're intending. Um, same thing for something like volume. It could mean the loudness or the quietness of, you know, the, the, uh, of what of some sound, or it could mean sort of the space, you know, how much space is taking up or, you know, how big is a container. Um, but these are very distinct. These are clear meanings. They're just different meanings for this word. And so uh, that's what it means to be ambiguous, right? If a word, a set of symbols here is, uh, is ambiguous, then uh, it's got more than one distinct meaning. 
as opposed to a word that's vague, uh, it's also got sort of the specific meaning, but uh, the, the, uh, the concept that's being referred to allows, as we say here, borderline cases. Um, and the classic one that gets talked about a lot in introductory philosophy classes or even advanced philosophy classes is bald. So, you know, am I bald? It's like, sort of. <laughs> and that's sort of, you know, just me saying that indicates that this is a vague term. Right? I certainly have a lot less hair on my head than I used to, um, but it's not completely gone. You know, there's still some hair there. Uh, and so, you know, maybe at this point in my life, I'm still a little bit, a little bit of a borderline case of being bald. I'm sort of bald. Right? Um, and so, is it true? If somebody says, Mike is bald, is that true? Or is that false? Like, well, you know, it sort of depends on where you go here. You know, if I pluck one more hair off my head, does that make me bald? It's like, well, just the loss of a single hair can't make you bald. But, you know, I keep doing that and, and doing that and doing that. I keep plucking out hairs. At some point, a transition is going to happen, right? From being like almost, you know, being sort of bald to being bald. Where does that transition actually happen? We can't sort of nail it down. It's like, oh, as soon as you pluck that last, that one more hair, then you're automatically going to become bald. It's like, that's just not the way this term works. Same thing with these others, you know, tall. Uh, so if somebody's six feet, six feet high, you know, six, six feet in height, uh, is that tall? It's like, well, they're pretty tall, um, kind of tall. Uh, but if they're seven feet, tall. Right? Um, if they're five feet, not tall. Six feet, kinda, <laughs> um, and so it's vague. You know, so if I say Bob is tall, it's like, is that true? Is that false? It's like, well, he might be in the gray zone, right? He might be, you know, maybe he's 5'10", 5 5'11", 5 and he's getting towards kinda tall. And strong, capable, you know, there's a huge variety of words in the English language that are vague in this way. And uh, that's fine in regular natural language, but when it comes to logic, and if these terms are being used in premises or in a conclusion in a specific argument, we need to nail down exactly what the meaning is um, so that we can assess whether the proposition that's including these words, um, determining whether those propositions are really true or false. Okay, um, so uh, the rest of chapter three, we'll go further into this uh, definitions and the different kinds of definitions and what counts as a good definition versus bad definition. Uh, but uh, so that's, that's sort of the, the preview or the, the preamble to that. And uh, so I'll go ahead and stop there for now.